A Christmas Love Redeemed by Alison Stewart A Regency Romance Novella Narrated by Catherine Bilson Chapter 1 London, 16th December, 1816 Fabien Brassard, the Comte de Montclair, paused at the head of the graceful stairs leading down into the ballroom of his sister's fashionable Mayfair residence. Delicate lace fans waved in sudden agitation as if a draught of tropical air had descended on the room. Aware that his entrance had created something of a stir, Fabienne touched the diamond cravat pin at his throat and surveyed the crowded room. You're late, Fabienne, his sister remarked as he stooped to kiss her proffered cheek. I thought your manners were better than that. I was unavoidably detained, the Comte murmured. Who was she? his sister inquired, in a tone that indicated she did not expect an answer, but had resigned herself to her brother's frequent, unavoidable detentions. Fabien did not reply, merely gave Marie the benefit of his most charming smile and offered her his arm. She guided him towards her husband, skillfully traversing the sea of suitable young women who simpered in his general direction, fans fluttering like a rabble of butterflies. As they approached, one of the men gave a snort and said, Who's that Frenchie with your wife, the God? One minute we're fighting the damn scoundrels, and next they're taking over our ballrooms and seducing our women. Marie's fingers dug into Fabian's arm, warning him, reminding him that this was London and he was a Frenchman on English soil. His sister had married the Earl of Lidbury during the time of peace between the two countries, before Napoleon had taken it upon himself to return to France the previous year. That Frenchy is my brother-in-law, Lidbury said, his stiff tone revealing his thoughts on his friend's outburst. He turned to greet Fabien with an outstretched hand. Montclair, old chap. What brings you to London, Montclair? One of Lidbury's companions inquired. Lidbury answered for him. He's here at the behest of the French ambassador. Some trade negotiations or other. Do you speak English? The first man, who had been so insulting, inquired. Fabian was tempted for a moment to pretend he didn't. Instead, he smiled at the man. I speak it fluently, sir. Montclair was a prisoner of war here for a few years, Lidbury said. Oh, so you fought for the bastard Napoleon? I served in the Navy of France, Fabian replied. My loyalty is always to my country first. The man snorted and his eyes narrowed. I lost my boy at Copenhagen. Fabian inclined his head. I am sorry for your loss, sir. There were too many deaths. I think, Marie said that this is not an occasion for discussing such things, gentlemen. There are so many beautiful young women, and, messieurs, your own good wives, to divert you from any dark thoughts. Marie, my dear, you're right as always. Lidbury indicated a group of young ladies who were watching the group from over the top of their fans. There's some fine-looking fillies with an eye for you, Montclair. I'm not here to entertain fatuous young girls. Fabian hissed in his sister's ear as she turned him to face the room again. Marie's smile did not slip as she murmured, No, indeed, married women are far more your style, are they not, brother? Fabian glowered at her, but undeterred, she steered him towards another clutch of debutantes hovering near one of the elegant pillars with their chaperones. Mes chers, Marie beamed, allow me to present my brother, the Comte de Montclair. She reeled off the young ladies' names, and Fabian bowed low as the girls curtsied in a sigh of silk and satin dresses. As he raised his head, he allowed his gaze to stray with more interest over the formidable mamas and chaperones standing in a group behind the girls. Marie was correct. A neglected, attractive married woman made a much more interesting target than these fluttering ninnies. One woman stood apart from the others, almost lost in the shadow of the balcony, but he felt her gaze on his face, searing to his soul. 
Her dreary gown set her apart as the chaperone of one of the young women, and he glimpsed apprehension in her stiff shoulders. Apprehension, and yet, something familiar. It couldn't be. Surely not. Not after all these years. Fabien? Marie's voice jolted him back to the present. My apologies. Mademoiselle. He offered his arm to the nearest girl. May I have the pleasure? His partner giggled, and he winced inwardly, ignoring the surreptitious victory glances she cast towards her friends as he led her onto the dance floor. He made polite conversation, but he kept glancing back at the mysterious woman in the grey gown. She seemed to have completely retreated into the shadows of the balcony. You are here with friends, mademoiselle, he asked. Oh, yes, the girl, whose name he could not recall, responded. And who is the lady in the grey gown who hides in the shadows? Oh, her, the girl remarked with a dismissive sniff. That's Lady Maxwell. She's Sophie Westhall's chaperone. At least, Sophie's grandfather pays her to act as chaperone. Mama says that she is a person of no consequence. She waved at a plain, rather dumpy girl with buck teeth, dancing nearby. That's Sophie. But Fabian had no interest in Sophie Westhall. Maxwell. The girl had called the chaperone Lady Maxwell. Fabian's breath stopped as the tug of the past pulled him back to the memory of the slight girl struggling in the arms of Sir Simon Maxwell, her chestnut curls in disorder as she pleaded for Fabian's life. It was true, the story her mother had told him in her letter, Hannah Linton had become Lady Maxwell. At the conclusion of the dance, Fabian bowed to his partner and let her return to her mamma. He scanned the crowd, trying to make Lady Maxwell out among the gathering, but he could see neither her nor her charge. But Lady Maxwell, Sophie wailed, Lord Easterbrook had asked me for the supper dance. I have a headache, Hannah snapped. I could not have borne another moment in that room. Your headache is not my concern. You are paid to see that I am properly chaperoned. It was humiliating having to leave before supper. And if I had thrown up, would that not have caused you more embarrassment? Hannah leaned back against the coach seat and closed her eyes. She had not lied. The throbbing in her head felt like the pounding of a blacksmith's hammer. Sophie snivelled. Hannah opened one eye and regarded her charge with irritation. As unprepossessing as the Honourable Sophie might appear, she would have no difficulty snaring a husband. A comfortable dowry of £20,000 would ensure her future with Lord Easterbrook, or someone like him. It didn't really matter. Sophie had never known poverty, had never had her home taken from her. Nor would circumstances ever force the Honourable Sophie into a marriage that would be so hateful that she would spend every day in contemplation of taking her life. But then, it was doubtful that Sophie would ever know what it was to be truly in love. Maybe that was for the best. Hannah allowed herself a bitter smile. The memory of that love, fleeting and intense as it had been, had both sustained and tormented her for the five long years of her marriage to Sir Simon Maxwell. Every day a torment, until the happy day he broke his neck in a hunting accident. But he had left her as penniless as she had been on the day he married her. She had been forced to sell what assets he had not mortgaged, and once again found herself in the invidious position of facing a life of genteel poverty. It left her with little choice but to take on the role of chaperone to girls such as Sophie Westhall, who lacked a female relative to see to their first season. If she failed to see her charge married, or at least betrothed by the end of the season, it would be unlikely any more commissions of this nature would come her way. Sophie flounced up the stairs to her bedchamber and flung herself full length on her bed. When I marry Lord Easterbrook, she announced, I will hold balls every night. Hannah, engaged in removing her gloves, looked down at her charge. I think any man you marry had better have deep pockets, she remarked. Oh, I've plenty of money, Sophie said, and I will marry a rich husband and have diamonds and pearls. 
Not like you. The girl sat up and seized Hannah's right hand. How pitiful that the only jewellery you wear is that pathetic little ring. Is that the best Sir Simon could afford? Hannah snatched her hand away, the threat of tears stinging her eyes. Not trusting herself to speak, she turned and left the room, closing the door behind her. In her own bedchamber, she sat down at the dressing table and stared sightlessly at her reflection in the mirror while she turned the little ring on her finger, half daring to hope, half hoping she might be wrong. The door latch clicked, but she didn't turn her head as her own maid, Bet, said, I didn't expect you back so early. I have a headache, and it was so unbearably hot in that ballroom. I suppose her nibs wasn't too pleased to be dragged away. I heard her screaming at poor Ellis. No, she wasn't. Bet unpinned Hannah's hair. The relief from the dragging weight of her hair and the sharp pins helped to clear her head. In a small, tight voice, she uttered the words she had been holding to her heart. I saw him tonight, Bet. He was at the ball. Who? Bet inquired, her voice muffled by a mouthful of hairpins. Fabian. Hairpins fell to the floor with a succession of soft pings, and Bet laid her hand on her mistress's shoulder. No, milady, you must have been mistook. No mistake, Bet. Older, of course, but still Fabian. Hannah shook her head. He didn't even recognize me. She heard the hurt and bitterness in her voice, remembering that awful moment when Fabian Brassard had entered the ballroom. Despite the immaculate and expensive clothes, he had still been recognizable as the half-drowned sailor she had rescued so many years ago, a lifetime ago. He had stood on the steps, his gaze sweeping the room, passing by her with no recognition in those green depths. Green, like the sea he had come from. She straightened her shoulders and picked up her brush, attacking her hair with the ferocity of her pent-up emotion. There is no reason why he would recognize me after all these years, and after all, he is a count and I'm... Bet rested the brush from her hand. You're still the same person you was nine years ago, Miss Hannah. Hannah shook her head. No, I'm not, Bet. Sir Simon Maxwell had beaten that person out of her a long time ago. She lay in bed, staring up at the ceiling, her fingers twisting the little garnet ring she wore on her right hand. Was it possible that a shred of the old Hannah Linton still remained? Would the Grand Comte de Montclair still recognise the girl who nearly gave her life to save him? She stilled her restless hand. Pointless to dream, to hope. She was Lady Hannah Maxwell, and she knew what they called her in whispered conversations, a person of no consequence. Chapter 2 Dorset Coast, 16th December, 1807 Hannah lay full length on the cold, dry ground, her brother's spyglass pressed to her eye. For the last hour, she had been engrossed in the cat-and-mouse game taking place off the Dorset coast between a French corvette and a larger English frigate. The little French ship, flying its flag proudly despite its proximity to the English coast, had managed to evade the slower, less manoeuvrable English ship, but now the frigate had it trapped against the coast. Hannah's heart leaped as she heard the distant poof of gunfire, white smoke emanating from the frigate's gun ports. The French ship's mainmast toppled slowly towards the water, its sails billowing like a woman's petticoat sinking into a curtsy. Although crippled and helpless, the guns of the corvette hammered away in the face of the superior English firepower. Another sally from the frigate and the little corvette lurched in the water. Hannah squeezed her eyes tight shut, not wishing to witness the last minutes of the little ship. It had fought bravely, defied the odds, and lost. Hannah! Her mother's voice drifted towards her on the sea breeze. She slammed the spyglass shut and stood up, casting a regretful glance at the now empty skyline. She pulled her heavy woolen shawl around her and took the path across the cliff top to the cottage, nestled in the lee of the cliff, 
a quiet, isolated place, the last refuge for herself and her mother and their two servants. The next morning, as was her habit, she rose early, taking the steep path that led down to the isolated cove. She hesitated before stepping onto the sand. Broken shards of wood and smashed boxes tangled with ropes marked the high tide line, a testimony to the previous day's encounter off the headland. The last thing she wished to encounter was any bodies, but the beach seemed clear of the human cost of the sea battle. Hannah walked slowly, inspecting the detritus for anything that might be interesting or valuable. These days her interest was not pure curiosity, anything of value could be sold, and with Christmas only a few days away, a few extra pennies for treats would be appreciated by her mother. As children, she and her brother William had played at pirates in the little cave concealed behind the fall of boulders at the end of the beach. Although no longer a child, Hannah still visited it on her rambles, sitting cross-legged on the warm, dry sand with her back to the rocks, listening to the crash of the sea and remembering those long-ago happy days. She used this precious time to write poems or little stories, taking gratitude that there were still things in her life to give her pleasure. The words of a poem about the last battle of the French corvette had been tugging at her sleeve and she clambered over the rocks, ducking her head as she entered the cave. As she reached for the tinder and candle she kept in a niche by the entrance, she hesitated, aware of the scent of sweat and something else, sharp and tangy above the familiar smells of the sand and sea. A dark shape loomed out of the dark, catching her wrist and spinning her around as a hand clamped over her mouth and something sharp pressed against her neck. Furious that someone had invaded her private domain, she grabbed the hand and bit down hard. The owner of the hand yelped and swore volubly in French, releasing her. Hannah whirled on her heel and made a dive for the cave entrance, but the Frenchman moved swiftly, coming between her and the daylight. They eyed each other across the distance of no more than two yards. With the light behind him, she could not make out any more than his silhouette, tall, slight, and wearing the coat of an officer of the line. Not a common sailor, but still an enemy on an enemy's soil, and dangerous. She straightened. Parlez-vous anglais? The man replied in heavily accented English. I do. My apologies, mademoiselle. I did not mean to frighten you. I will not hurt you. She took a step back. Were you on the French ship that sank yesterday? He paused before answering. I was. He let his hands drop to his side and took a step sideways, clearing the entrance. You are free to go, eh? He faltered and slid to the floor with a groan, his back to the wall of the cave. Mademoiselle, you have a duty to turn me into your authorities. I pray you go now. I shall be here when they return. I have nowhere else to go. Hannah didn't move. Are you hurt? He looked up at her, his eyes hidden in the dark shadows, appraising her. No, mademoiselle, your beauty has made me quite weak. Hannah bit her lip. What is your name? A smile fluttered across his lips. Forgive me for not arising. Fabien Brassard, et vous? Hannah Linton, she said. I live close to here. She turned to the niche in the wall. Locating the candle stub and tinder, she lit the candle and turned back to face him. In the thin, flickering light, she could make out a lean, handsome face with the stubble of a day's growth of beard on his chin. His dark hair had been cut short in the new fashion. It struck her how young he was, probably no older than William. Only a few years older than herself, perhaps. He inspected the bite mark on his hand and smiled. You are well prepared, Miss Linton. My brother and I used to play in here. She set the candle in the sand and knelt down in front of him, keeping an arm's length of distance between them. Assuming her mother's air of brisk efficiency, she said, Where are you hurt? He drew back his uniform coat. The once white breeches were stained a dull, watery brown, and it took a moment or two to see a jagged piece of wood protruding from his right side, just beneath his ribs. 
she gave a sharp intake of breath and sat back on her heels. Was this what happened when round shot smashed into the fabric of wooden ships? Was this how William had died? She clapped a hand to her mouth to stop the tears that welled. Fabian pulled the coat back across the wound. I am sorry, mademoiselle. I didn't mean to alarm you. She shook her head. No, no, it's not that, she said. My brother, my brother died at Trafalgar. He would have been about your age. The Frenchman's steady eyes met hers. I am sorry, he said. You have no reason to help me. Should I pull it out? She ventured uncertainly. His lips twitched with amusement. I think if you did that, mademoiselle, there would be one fewer Frenchman to bother you. It needs a surgeon's skill. She rose to her feet. You'll have to come home with me. My mother can send for the surgeon. Can you walk? Perhaps, if you can help me stand, Miss Linton. Hannah slipped her arm under his left shoulder and helped him to his feet. Up close, he smelled of salt, sweat and blood, mingled with the unmistakable reek of gunpowder. Pain creased his face, but he did no more than grunt as she took his weight and they clambered out onto the beach. She hoisted him closer to provide better support, but he was so much taller than her that she felt inadequate to the task ahead. Is it far? he asked. Along the beach and up the cliff path, Hannah said, with more confidence than she felt. He turned his face to the wintry sun. After the events of the day before, being washed ashore and surviving a cold, damp night in a cave with a nasty wound, he must be on the last reserves of his strength, and his unshaven face was grey with pain and exhaustion. He leached cold, and his clothes were still damp. If she did not hurry to get him to care, he could die not just from the wound, but lung fever or any number of maladies. They made slow but steady progress along the beach, feet slipping in the shifting sands. The path up the cliff was not wide enough to allow for two abreast, so she made him go first, chivying him when he faltered. At the top of the cliff, he sank to the earth with his back against a rock, his breath coming in shallow gasps. Is it much further? Hannah pointed to the curls of smoke rising from the kitchen chimney below them. Not far, she said. Can you make it? She slid her arm around him again and his weight sank against her slight frame. As she neared the gate to the kitchen garden, her mother came flying out of the back door. Hannah! At the sound of her mother's voice, Fabian stiffened and tried to pull away. Mrs. Linton slowed her step, standing in the path, her hands on her hips. Madame, your servant, he began, but got no further. His knees gave way, and he sank to the ground, dragging Hannah with him. Hannah disengaged herself from the unconscious Frenchman, and both women stood looking down at him. Mrs. Linton took a deep breath. Hannah! I think he was on that French corvette that went down yesterday off the headland. Hannah said with a rush. He was in the cave. He's hurt, Mamma. He needs a surgeon. Mrs. Linton shook her head. Hannah, what have you done? She knelt down beside the wounded sailor and turned back his uniform jacket. She touched the ugly splinter of wood and grimaced. He's a problem, that's what he is. Her hand went to her throat. Sir Simon Maxwell has half the county out looking for survivors from that wreck. If we turn him over to Sir Simon in this condition, he'll die, Hannah said. Her mother looked up at her. Then we had better ensure he is in a fit condition to be handed over. We have to get him into the house. I would like to see how bad that wound is. She rose to her feet, running her hands down her skirt. A dead Frenchman is going to be considerably more of a problem than a living one. We can only pray that God will spare him. With the help of Noah, their man of all work, they half carried, half dragged Fabian to the cottage and up the narrow stairs to the small bedroom Hannah occupied in the cottage. Despite Hannah's offer to help, Mrs. Linton closed the door on her while she and their loyal maid, Bet, 
dealt with Fabian's wound, extracting the splinter of wood and cleaning it of debris. No one mentioned the unwanted visitor who tossed in a feverish sleep upstairs as the small household sat for dinner. A loud knocking on the door made Mrs. Linton start. Hannah and her mother exchanged glances as Bet answered the door. Sir Simon, what brings you out on such a cold night? Bet asked with a forced cheerfulness. Unbidden, Sir Simon stepped into the tiny parlour. A large man in height and girth, he almost had to stoop to stand upright. He planted his feet in front of their meagre fire and looked around. Have you eaten? Mrs. Linton asked, gesturing at an empty chair. How could her mother sound so calm? No, thank you, Mrs. Linton. We're on the hunt for survivors from that French ship that went down just off the coast yesterday, he said. Hannah held her breath, her fingers twisting together under the table. By rights, this was the moment her mother should hand Fabian over to Maxwell and their lives would continue as before. Instead, Mrs. Linton continued in her calm, untroubled voice. And have you found any? Picked up a poxy little Frenchie off the wine glass beach yesterday, but looks to me like most of them went down with the ship. Bodies will be washing up over the next day or so. My advice to you, Miss Linton, he looked at Hannah, is stay away from the beach. Not a sight for a young girl like you. Whenever Sir Simon looked at her, his eyes raked her, lingering too long on her chest. She shivered, and Sir Simon, mistaking her frisson for one of fear of dead bodies, laughed. No need to worry, Miss Linton. A dead Frenchie's not going to hurt you. It's the live ones we worry about. And what do you do with the live ones? Hannah inquired, hoping she sounded as calm as her mother. Well, if I had my way, I'd finish the job, but the law says they're to be kept nice and snug. Don't mean they have to be comfortable. He gave her a wink. We're putting him in Dorchester jail till they can be taken up to London. We've some nice dark cells with some pleasant furry companions. That'll teach him. Hannah avoided her mother's eyes, but she knew from Mrs. Linton's whitened knuckles that her thoughts were on the young man upstairs. In his present condition, being moved to a jail cell in the middle of winter could have only one outcome. Surely, Sir Simon, Mrs. Linton ventured, some Christian compassion should be shown. Prisoners of war don't deserve Christian compassion, Mrs. Linton. Sir Simon swivelled his gaze from Hannah's neckline to her mother. Well, I've kept you long enough, he said. Keep your door bolted at night and send word if you see strangers. Of course, Sir Simon, Mrs. Linton said. She closed the door behind him, leaning against it. It ain't right, Noah complained when Mrs. Linton returned to the table. That bloody Frenchie should be handed over to the authorities. And he will be, when he is strong enough, Mrs. Linton said. But I cannot, in all Christian conscience, condemn him to death in a prison cell. I keep thinking about William and how grateful I would be to know a good Christian woman cared for him in his hour of need. Now, mind your own business and keep a still tongue in your head, Noah. Noah pushed his chair back, rising stiffly to his feet. He'd been with the Linton family since boyhood, and now the years lay on his stooped shoulders and grey hair. I'll fetch in some more wood for the fire, he said. Mrs. Linton sat up with the sick man through the night, and in the morning, at Hannah's insistence, took a rest, leaving Hannah on sick room duty. Sick rooms reminded her of her father's drawn-out death, and of a life that was no longer hers, but as she pushed open the door, her heart gave an unfamiliar jolt at the sight of the man in her bed. His face was turned away from her, and beneath the open neck of one of William's old nightshirts, a gold chain glinted in the morning light. He lay so still that for a horrible moment she thought the man tangled in the bedclothes was dead. She drew a chair up to the bed and took his hand, his fingers as icy as they had been when she first met him. He stirred and his fingers tightened on hers. She let out her breath as his eyes flickered open and he smiled. My angel of mercy, he said in French. 
Grateful for her parents' insistence on her own education, Hannah responded in French. How are you? I've been better, he said. Mama says the wound was not so bad. She managed to clean it properly, and she thinks you will live. I don't think I will ever be able to repay your mother's kindness. She has no reason to care for an enemy of this country. Hannah withdrew her hand from his. That's because she is not seeing you. She is seeing my brother. She paused. Were you there, at Trafalgar? He shook his head. No, we were patrolling the Spanish coast. So you have no reason for regret, she said. William is dead. Nothing will bring him back. She paused. I saw what happened yesterday. I don't understand why you would be so close to England. A slow smile lit Fabian's unshaven face. Is this an interrogation, mademoiselle? He shook his head. Stupid, drunken fool of a captain put us off course. By the time I realized where we were, he was in a drunken stupor, and I had an English frigate on my tail. So you were in command when the frigate caught you? It was amazing sailing. You nearly got away. His face hardened. We would have done, but the rudder broke, he said, with marked bitterness in his voice. Could I trouble you for a drink of water? She poured him a cup from the jug on the small table, and he pulled himself up in the bed with a grimace. After he had drained the cup, he thanked her and sank back on the pillows. He closed his eyes, and Hannah sat quietly watching while he slept. Chapter 3 London, 18th December, 1816 Fabien, mon cher, please sit down. Your pacing is making me quite weary. Marie, Countess Lidbury, looked up from the letter she had been writing for the last half hour. Is it the negotiations that trouble you? Fabian stopped his perambulation of the room and looked at his sister. Negotiations? No. Since the ball, he had hardly spared a thought for the important negotiations that had brought him to London. Then what troubles you? His sister laid down her pen. Are you acquainted with a Lady Maxwell? A smile curved the corner of Marie's mouth. One of your married ladies? Fabian stared at his sister in horror. One of my... Mon Dieu, Marie, you make me out to be some sort of monster. Marie looked chastened. I apologize. Please, Fabian, sit down and tell me what is bothering you and how it concerns Lady Maxwell. Fabian hitched up his coattails and drew a chair up to his sister. What do you know of her? Maxwell, Marie frowned. Ah, I recall. She is the chaperone of that silly girl, Sophie Westall. I believe her husband, Sir Simon Maxwell, left her nothing, and she must earn her living as a companion or a chaperone. But why should she concern you? She is a woman of no great consequence, certainly not your usual preference. Marie's careless shrug added emphasis to her words, dismissing Lady Maxwell from consideration. But Fabian did not hear the last remark. Maxwell is dead. Hope sparked in his chest. I believe so. Were you acquainted with Sir Simon? Fabian rose to his feet and paced the room again as the memories came flooding back. It was so long ago. He turned to his sister. Do you recall when that stupid drunken sot of a captain sailed the Marguerite into English waters? Of course, mon cher. How could I forget? You were a prisoner of the English for how long? Eighteen months, but that is not the point. There was a girl called Hannah Linton who saved my life. She and her mother tended my wound and cared for me before I was captured. Hannah Linton? Marie's eyes widened. Surely not this Lady Maxwell? His silence gave Marie the answer she sought. She rose to her feet and patted his cheek as only an older sister could. Fabian, 
she said. That was nine years ago. In the circumstances, any tendresse you may have felt was just infatuation. I must remind you that you have a great future in the new France, and any woman you choose must be of the first order, not a shabby little English widow. She laughed. Tiens, she has probably forgotten you. Fabian turned his back on his sister and crossed to the window. Clasping his hands behind his back, he looked out on the busy street scene below him, seeing not the carts, pedestrians and flower sellers, but the rugged cliffs of Dorset and an angel with chestnut ringlets and a smudge of dirt on her cheek. Of course, you are right, Marie. You always are, he said. Chapter 4 Dorset Coast, 21st December, 1807 It had been unsurprising that the wounded man developed a fever, and for a worrying twenty-four hours the Linton women feared they might lose him, but on the fourth day Fabian's fever abated, and on the sixth day Mrs. Linton permitted him to rise from his bed and sit beside the small fire. Invalid status irked him, but he had to admit that he had the strength of a kitten, and the wound to his side needed time and patience to heal, so he did as he was told. He struggled with reading English, but the selection on the mantelpiece was limited, so he selected a familiar story and settled down to read it. A knock on the door gave him the excuse to set aside the book with a grateful sigh, and he smiled as Hannah Linton entered. After the sharp-tongued bet and the brisk efficiency of Madame Linton, Hannah's pretty face and ready smile would be a welcome distraction. She glanced behind her and shut the door. My sea sprite, he said. I thought I was your angel of mercy. He nodded and spread his hands. You are both, Shai. I owe you and your mother my life. Hannah drew the stool closer to the fire and sat down, warming her hands. What are you reading? He held up the copy of Gulliver's Travels. That was my brother's, she said. He studied her face. You miss him. She nodded. More than I can say. It all went wrong when he died. What do you mean? We used to live in the manor house. She pointed through the wall in the vague direction of north. But it was entailed, and when William died it passed to a distant cousin. He leased it to Sir Simon Maxwell, our local justice of the peace, and we were turned out. All Mamma had was a small annuity and a promise from our cousin that we should be allowed to live in this cottage. Ah, that explained how two gently-born ladies came to be living in such a tiny cottage. Fabian studied her face, seeing the injustice meted out to two innocent women whose only sin was to be born female. Where do you live? she asked. My family estates are near the Loire, he said. A very beautiful part of the country. He thought longingly of the graceful chateau, with so many rooms no one had bothered to count them. France might only be twenty or so miles from the door of this cottage, but it might as well have been on the moon. You still have them? Our estates? It seemed a strange question, but of course she was thinking of the revolution. They were restored to my father by Napoleon when he became emperor, he replied along with the title Comte de Montclair. My father and uncles have always been loyal to Napoleon. It must have been a difficult time. I was just a child, but yes, it was not called the terror without just cause. My grandfather was guillotined, but then so was the town baker. The killing was vengeful and indiscriminate. My father was an officer in the army and decided discretion was the better part of valour and committed to the Republican cause. I preferred the sea and joined the navy when I was fifteen. How old are you now? Twenty-four, et toi? I am nineteen. Her answer surprised him. He had thought she was a little younger. I have no dowry and no prospects, she continued. My father was a gambler, so all that we had was the estate. She looked down at her hands. Are you? She cleared her throat. Are you married? He shook his head. 
There's been no time in my life for marriage or betrothal. Hannah said nothing. She leaned forward and poked the fire into life. The light glinted behind her eyes as she watched the flames dance, and Fabian saw behind the dowdy clothes there was a fire within this girl. A strength he had never found in any of his sister's vacuous friends or the suitable young ladies his mother threw in his path. He would be the Comte de Montclair when his father died, and it behoved him to marry well and restore the family's lost fortune, but he'd never met anyone who stirred his soul the way this woman did, and at nineteen she was a woman, not a girl. If their circumstances were anything but what they were now, he closed his eyes. To even think that was foolishness. Why has your mother not turned me over to the authorities yet? he asked. Do you wish to be turned over? Hannah's eyes met his. Fabian laughed, a mistake. His wound caught and he grimaced. My dear Hannah, I am on the wrong side of the English Channel. I do not see there is any alternative. Hannah's nose crinkled. I've been thinking. If you make your way to Poole, there is a good chance you can find someone willing to take you across the Channel for a price. Hope bubbled in Fabian's chest, but sank as he realised that his purse, even if it had contained any useful currency, was at the bottom of the sea. His fingers strayed to the chain around his neck. Perhaps. What is the date? The 21st of December. It will be Christmas in a few days, Hannah said. That might be a good time to leave. Everyone will be busy with their festivities. No one will pay you any heed. And this pool, is it far? Four miles to the west, he nodded. An easy walk, but for a man barely out of his sickbed. Her hair had fallen forward, hiding her face, and he leaned forward, pushing the wayward chestnut locks back behind her ear. To his surprise, she did not pull back. She looked up at him, her grey eyes large in her pointed face, her lips parted. Tense, she was lovely. He picked up her hand from her lap and pressed each finger to his lips. Her eyes never left his face, and when he released her hand, she twisted, pillowing her head in her arms on his knee. Please say nothing, he silently begged her. Let us just have this moment for ourselves. He let his fingers stray over her hair, gently twisting the soft chestnut curls. Chapter 5 London, 21st December, 1816 Hannah kept the discreet distance as Sophie and Lord Easterbrook strolled through Kensington Gardens. Easterbrook had met them at their carriage with a small bunch of snowdrops, which he proffered to Sophie with a flourish. Sophie had blushed prettily as she accepted the nosegay, and as they strolled, she occasionally pressed the flowers to her face. Hannah allowed herself a smile at the extravagant play-acting. The girl's simpering giggles grated on her nerves, but she was pleased to see his lordship put on a brave appearance of being captivated by Sophie's charms. These were, no doubt, considerably improved by her substantial dowry, particularly as her research had revealed Lord Easterbrook had considerable gambling debts. A match made in heaven. She had done her job, and, if everything went according to plan, she had no doubt that the engagement would be announced by the end of the season. A small group of ladies and gentlemen approached from the opposite direction. The ladies, dressed in the height of fashion, carried extravagant muffs in one hand as they walked with their arms looped into those of the gentlemen in their tall hats and impeccable coats. As the group neared, Hannah's heart gave a lurch as she recognised Fabian Brassard as one of the elegantly dressed gentlemen. She had not seen him since the Lidbury's ball, and she had prayed that he had returned to France, but no, here he was, with no other than Lady Darlington hanging off his arm, with a quite improper familiarity. The lady was notorious for her scandalous affairs, news of which apparently failed to reach the ears of her patient and besotted husband. Lady Darlington laughed, clasping her escort's arm so close, her head almost rested on his shoulder. The other gentleman, Sir Ninian Davis, a rake hell by reputation, 
hailed Easterbrook, and it seemed a close encounter could not be avoided. Easterbrook, old chap, Davis said and turned to Sophie. And you must be the enchanting Miss Westhall all of society is talking about. Sophie giggled and simpered, holding out her hand to Davis. No one even looked at Hannah. As he had at the ball, Fabian's gaze passed over her apparently without recognition. A hard knot of disappointment lodged in Hannah's throat as Sophie was formally presented to the party. Fabian bowed gracefully and passed a comment about the fine winter's day. A short discussion on the weather followed, and the two parties made their bows and obeisances and separated. As they passed, Hannah heard Lady Darlington say, Who was that dowdy piece with Miss Westhall? Oh, her? Lady Whitnell, Sir Ninian's companion, glanced back. That's the woman the girl's grandfather has employed as chaperone for the season. Can't tell you her name. It's of no consequence. Her words flew through the cold air, striking Hannah between the shoulder blades with the force of an arrow. Any further conversation was lost as Fabian's party rounded a bend and Easterbrook and Sophie stepped into a convenient, pretty little gazebo. Hannah sank onto a bench nearby, her heart bound in a tight call of misery and humiliation. Her name, Fabian said, keeping his anger in check with difficulty, is Lady Maxwell and I beg to differ, chère madame. Everyone is of consequence, however great or small. My dear Fabian, you do surprise me, Lady Darlington said. How do you come to be acquainted with such a nobody? Fabian's heart clenched, and he resisted the urge to throw off the woman's arm. Her cloying touch revolted him, but, he reminded himself, he had made this particular bed, and until recently had lain in it, enjoying the delights Elizabeth Darlington offered. Now, like a surfeit of chocolate, she had palled and left him feeling faintly nauseated. He forced a smile. I make it my business to know everybody. Tell me, Elizabeth, is the charming Miss Westall invited to attend your Christmas Eve ball? Elizabeth Darlington shrugged. If she is not on the invitation list, shall I make sure she receives an invitation? And Lady Maxwell, Fabian said. But as her chaperone, she will attend. Please, for me, Elizabeth, a separate invitation. The woman's knowing eyes danced over his face. I sense there is a story here, Fabian. I will send the invitations, but only on one condition. You tell me why this woman is so important to you. Fabian lifted Lady Darlington's hand to his lips. Thank you, Elizabeth, but be content with the knowledge that I was acquainted with Lady Maxwell some years ago. Please do not ask any more of me. The woman rolled her eyes. You have me thoroughly intrigued, Fabian, and it is as well for you I am not the jealous type. Chapter 6 Dorset Coast, 23rd December, 1807 Fabian stood by the little dormer window in the tiny bedroom, one arm resting on the wall above his head, looking out over the cliff to the grey, wintry sea, and beyond that, the distant, shadowy curve of La Belle France. He had agreed with Hannah that on Christmas Day, when the household had gone to church, he would leave, following the crudely drawn map she had made for him. In Poole he would find a fisherman, someone prepared to take him to France for the price of a gold chain. He knew human nature it would not be hard to find such a one. The door creaked open, and he turned to Hannah. She closed the door and stood with her hands behind her back. What are you thinking? she asked. He shrugged. I was thinking of my plans. I've said nothing to Mamma. It is best she not know. She held out a package wrapped up in brown paper and tied with string. This is for you. He accepted the parcel, his fingers brushing hers, and sat down on the edge of the bed to unwrap it. She sat next to him. Do you like it? He unfolded the grey, woolen knitted scarf and held it up. Parfait, he said. Just what I will need. I made it for William, but, but he has no need of it any more. A tear ran down her cheek, and he brushed it away with his thumb. 
Thank you, Hannah. You have already given me so much. And now I have something for you. He had given the matter of a parting gift a deal of thought, and apart from the chain, he had only one thing of value. Hannah, he said, if circumstances were different, there would be time for us, but as things stand, I want to give you something to remember me. He undid the gold chain from around his neck and slipped off the small garnet ring that hung from it. As a piece of jewellery, it was unassuming and probably of little real value, but to him it was priceless. He reached for her hand and pressed it into the palm, closing her fingers around it. It was my mother's, he said. It was given to her by her grandfather, and she wore it always. She uncurled her fingers, looking down at the little gold circlet with its single stone. I can't accept this. Please. It is a mark of my gratitude to you, and also a pledge that in better times I will return to claim it. She looked up at him, her grey eyes swimming with unshed tears. Fabian, I know this is wrong. We have known each other so little time, but the moment I saw you in that cave, I wanted it to be you. He reached up and tucked a curl of chestnut hair behind her ear, his hand slipping behind her head, drawing her close to him. The moment their lips touched, he was lost. Hannah Linton, his sea sprite, his angel of mercy. She broke away with a gasp, staring at him wide-eyed. Fabian! He ran a hand through his hair. Pardon, Hannah. That was presumptuous. She shook her head. No. Please kiss me again, Fabian. I want to remember you. I want to remember what this moment feels like. And he kissed her again, losing himself in the moment. Was it possible to fall in love in just nine days? The old Fabian Brassard would have laughed at such foolishness, but that Fabian had gone to the bottom of the English Channel. If there was one certainty in his life here and now, it was Hannah Linton. When the war was over, and it would be over, he would return to England and win her heart again. Chapter 7 London, 24th December, 1816 a late and unexpected invitation to the much sought-after Lady Darlington's Christmas ball had thrown Sophie into a tiz of excitement. Her gown was wrong, her ribbons were wrong, her gloves were wrong. In the end, Hannah threw her hands in the air and braved the bustling London streets to undertake the last-minute shopping that Sophie required. She arrived back at the Mayfair house with her arms full of parcels to find Sophie reclining on a daybed in the parlour, reading a letter. The girl looked up as Hannah entered, depositing the parcels on a table. I have sent for tea, Hannah said. The shops were busy, and I am quite done in. Sophie wafted the paper in front of her face, a nasty, malicious little smile on her lips. This came for you while you were out. Hannah froze. For me? She frowned. And you opened it? How dare you? My French is not very good, but I think it's from that French count we met the other day. Is his name Fabian? That seems awfully familiar for someone you just met. Hannah lunged for the paper in Sophie's hand, but the girl was too quick, slipping from the daybed and dancing just out of Hannah's reach. Let me see. Oh, here's the word amour. I know what that means. Have you been conducting a flirtation, Lady Maxwell? Hannah found herself unable to speak. It is none of your concern, she managed at last. Oh, but it is, Lady Maxwell. You are paid to be my companion. You are not paid to conduct your own sordid little affairs. Sophie crossed to the fireplace and held the paper over the flickering embers. As Hannah lunged, she let the paper go, and it fell to the coals where it lingered for a moment before catching a light. Hannah knelt on the hearth, poker in hand, scrabbling through the embers, but it was too late. The letter had been reduced to ash. She remained kneeling, her hands in her lap, too bereft for tears. 
Sophie leaned over her. I shall tell Grandpapa of your carryings on, and you will be dismissed without reference. In fact, you may leave the house now. Hannah looked up at her young tormentor. It's Christmas Eve, and I have nowhere to go, and besides, who will chaperone you at the ball tonight? Sophie shrugged. I will pen a note to Louise's dear mamma saying you are indisposed and asking if she will chaperone me. You are not required, Lady Maxwell. Now pack your bags and go. Hannah did not move. Even after Sophie left the room, she remained on her knees, staring at the coals, at the ashes of Fabian's letter. How long she stayed there, she couldn't say, but Bet found her. I heard what that nasty little piece did, my lady, Bet said. Hannah rose to her feet, stiff and cold. I have been ordered to leave, she said. What are we going to do, Bet? Have tea in your room. I'll pack our things and we'll decide what to do, Bet said, as if being thrown out onto the streets on Christmas Eve was an everyday occurrence. As Bet bustled around the room, Hannah sat at the little table, staring at the now cold tea. An unopened envelope protruded from beneath the tea tray, and she extricated it. The envelope contained a stiff, gilt-edged invitation card to Lady Darlington's ball. She had paid it no heed when it had arrived, assuming that as Sophie's chaperone, her attendance was expected. Now she read it carefully, and in some confusion. It was not a duplicate invitation intended for Sophie. Her own name was inscribed on it. She had been invited in her own right. Fabian would be there, of that she was certain. Her pulse quickened. One last chance. She looked up at Bet. Keep my ball gown safe, Bet. I am going to a ball tonight. A wicked smile caught at Bet's mouth. The Honourable Sophie won't like that. Hannah's smile echoed her maids. The Honourable Sophie and all her friends can go to hell. Chapter 8 Dorset Coast, Christmas Day, 1807 Despite the distance from the village, the bells of the village church drifted in on a cold, clear morning. The Linton women and their two servants had gone to church, and Fabian was alone in the house. Mrs. Linton had left a pile of neatly folded clothes on a chair, but Fabian dressed in his ruined uniform. To be caught out of uniform might lead to allegations of spying, and that meant certain death. Better to be taken as a prisoner of war. A razor would have been useful, but in this house of women that was too much to expect. He was vain enough to frown at his ruffianly appearance in the speckled mirror and grimaced. Nothing to be done to remedy his vanity. The shoes that had been provided by Mrs. Linton were well kept and well worn, but they were a little large, so Hannah had stuffed paper in the toe. Dead man's shoes, he presumed, but he doubted William Linton would grudge him the use of his footwear. He thought about the cost of the war, and the young man whose death at the hands of his countrymen had turned the lives of these two women upside down. He was tired of war. When, if he returned to France, he would set his sword down and go home to his estate. Downstairs in the parlour, a clock struck eleven. The sooner he was away, the better it would be for them all. He donned the heavy coat Mrs. Linton had left and stuffed the grey woollen scarf into a pocket before turning to the window to check the weather. His heart lurched at the sight of a little figure in a dark cloak running up the path, holding onto her bonnet with one hand. Hannah. They had said their goodbyes. Something had to be wrong. He hurried down the stairs and caught her as she threw open the door. She gripped the sleeves of his greatcoat. You have to go right now, Fabian. He caught her urgency. What has happened? I overheard Noah telling Sir Simon that you were here. Mercifully, it is Christmas Day, and it will take him a little while to organise his men, but you must hide. You can't take the lane. They will be coming that way. He shook his head. Where will I go? Go to the cave where I found you. You should be safe enough there until dark, and then you can work your way around the beach. 
A cold wave of fear and despair washed over him. I knew I was bringing nothing but danger to you and your mother. Tears started in her eyes. Go, Fabian, go now. He pulled her towards him, folding her in his arms, and kissed her. Kissed her as if he intended to never let her go. She pressed against him, her need as great as his. If times were different, if, if, if. He pushed away. Hannah. Go! I will find you. She laid a finger on his lips. No, don't make promises, Fabian. Unable to bring himself to see the tears in her eyes, he turned and ran from the house. Sir Simon Maxwell seemed to fill the little parlour. He had arrived barely an hour after Fabian had left, and Hannah glanced through the open front door at the half-dozen red-coated soldiers lounging against their horses. One of Maxwell's men held two beagles on long ropes. Her mother had only just returned from church with Bet. She undid her bonnet strings and set the hat on the table. Sir Simon, I assure you we have seen no Frenchman here. That's not what I've been told. I have it on good authority that you have been harbouring an enemy under this roof. Now hand him over at once, or my men will tear this cottage apart. Mrs. Linton straightened. It's Christmas Day, a day for peace. Come back tomorrow. Sir Simon threw open the door and roared, Sergeant, bring me the informer. The soldiers straightened and dragged Noah in by the arm. Now then, man, tell these ladies what you told me. Noah looked from Hannah to her mother. I told them it was wrong. Her. He pointed at Hannah. She brung him here, and the two of them have been looking after him, all cosy-like. My nephew died in Spain. I hate the goddamned French bastards. Noah, Mrs. Linton began. She sank to a nearby chair with a shake of her head. Search the house. Hannah gripped her mother's hand as the soldiers tore their little home apart, looking for a Frenchman in places no man could hide. They threw the cupboards open, upended drawers, and pulled the mattresses from the beds. Not a sign of him, the sergeant reported at last. He held up Fabian's ruined and blood-stained shirt. Hannah should have burned it, but it had been balled into a corner and forgotten. Someone's been here. Found this. It's a man's garment. Hannah's hand tightened on her mother's. He was here this morning, Noah said. Can't have got far. He pointed a gnarled finger at the shirt. You can see for yourself, he was wounded. Maxwell considered the two women for a long, long moment. Get the dogs, he said, and bring the women. Maxwell's hunting beagles strained at their leads as their handler thrust Fabian's shirt into their snouts. Hannah's heart fell as the two dogs quickly found his scent and, with bays of delight at their own cleverness, headed off in the direction of the beach. One of the militiamen held the two women by their forearms, pushing them ahead of him. They stumbled on the narrow path, but he just dragged them up. Down on the beach, Fabian's footprints could be seen in the sand, but he'd had the presence of mind to go down to the water's edge, and from there his footprints and his scent disappeared. Could he have taken a boat, sir? the sergeant asked. Maxwell looked up and down the beach. Don't be ridiculous. Spread out. These cliffs must be riddled with caves. He won't be far. Maxwell's gaze fixed on the fallen rocks at the far end of the beach. With a quick nod to the man holding Hannah and her mother, he strode in that direction. He stopped a few yards short. Even from here, the entrance to the cave was not visible, but the imprint of a man's shoe could be seen in the damp sand. The two dogs sent up cries of delight at having found their quarry. I have the women, Maxwell shouted in French. Surrender yourself and they'll not be harmed. Hannah cried out and struggled against the man who held her, but he twisted her arm behind her back. Maxwell raised his pistol and shot into the air. The sound splintered the quiet cove, sending a flock of seagulls rising in protest. 
The next one will be for Mrs. Linton, execution for harboring the enemy, Maxwell said. He nodded at her captor who thrust her forward. She fell onto her knees in the sand. Release the women. Fabian came out from behind the rocks, his hands above his head. My name is Lieutenant Fabian Brassard. Please accept my surrender as an officer of the French Navy. Alas, I have no sword to offer you. Sir Simon stared, his jaw working as Fabian came towards him, and for an awful moment, Hannah thought Maxwell would order him to be shot out of hand. Fabian bowed. Your servant, Sir Simon. Maxwell looked from the Frenchman to the two women. You bloody traitors, he said. You'll pay for this. Fabian raised a placating hand. Please, Sir Simon, it is not the fault of Mrs. Linton or her daughter. I, I forced my way into their house and threatened, and threatened harm should they betray me. Sir Simon looked him up and down. Harm? With what? You said yourself you have no weapon, Lieutenant. I had a belaying pin that had washed up on the beach. But you don't have it now. Sir Simon, the lieutenant was wounded. It was my Christian duty to tend to his wounds. We intended to advise you of his presence, but with the weather and time of year. Mrs. Linton was struggling for words, and it was clear from the high colour in his face that Sir Simon believed none of their concocted story. Sir Simon turned to his sergeant. Take him away, he said. The man advanced toward the Frenchman. Fabian straightened, tugged at the collar of his battered uniform jacket, and bowed to the two Linton women. Au revoir. I apologise for my intrusion and the risk at which I have placed you. He looked at Sir Simon. For the last time, you have my word as a gentleman. These women are innocent. Sir Simon made a noise somewhere between a snarl and a grunt. Take the women back to the house. I'll deal with them shortly. It seemed like an eternity before Maxwell entered the cottage and ordered the man from the room. Mrs. Linton drew Hannah into her, closing her arms around her daughter as Sir Simon drew himself up and turned his thunderous gaze on them. Does the word traitor mean nothing to you? He raged at them. Mrs. Linton straightened. I only did what my Christian conscience dictated, she said. I didn't see an enemy. I saw only a sick boy who needed help. How many more English lives will he take, eh, madam? Sir Simon thrust his choleric face into Mrs. Linton's. I should have you both hanged for treason. Mrs. Linton thrust her daughter behind her. Then take me, Sir Simon, she said. This is none of my daughter's doing. Sir Simon turned away to gaze out of the window, his hands behind his back, the fingers working almost as if he were playing a musical instrument. When he turned back, the anger in his face had been replaced by something else, a slyness that made Hannah's skin crawl. He crossed to them and pulled Hannah out from behind her mother's back. How old are you? Nineteen, Hannah responded. He put a finger under Hannah's chin, tilting her face up towards him. He nodded as if in approval of what he saw. I will make a pact with you, Mrs. Linton. You can buy my silence for the price of your daughter. I need a biddable wife to give me an heir, and she's fair enough. No, Hannah and her mother cried out as one. Sir Simon grasped Hannah's arm, spinning her around to face her mother. Very well, if that is what you wish. Mrs. Linton, my men are still outside. You can both rot in Dorchester jail tonight, and you'll hang in the new year. Hannah turned a stricken face to her mother. No, this was my doing. Sir Simon, I will marry you on condition you spare my mother. Hannah, her mother began. Hannah took a deep, shuddering breath. We have no choice, Mamma. She turned back to Sir Simon. When? He licked his lips. As soon as a license can be arranged, my dear. You see, I'm not an unreasonable man, and you've made a very wise decision. One I shall live to regret. 
Just to make sure you don't abscond, Miss Linton, you can both come back to the hall with me now. We have a fine Christmas meal planned, and what better way to celebrate our betrothal? He smiled, revealing a row of yellowing mottled teeth. Hannah thought about Fabian and the kiss they had shared. That one precious moment in time when she had known perfect happiness. It was too late now for Hannah and Fabian. She touched the band of the little ring he had given her and made a silent vow that while she had breath in her body, she would never take it off. It would serve her always as a reminder of what it was to know love, even for a fleeting moment. Chapter 9 London, 24th December, 1816 the Christmas ball at the Darlington's Grand House was one of the highlights of the season. A couple of hundred people already packed the ballroom, spilling into the anterooms and, braving the cold and the soft blanket of snow, out onto the terrace. The already splendid house had been decorated for the season with boughs of greenery, strategically placed mistletoe and swags of red velvet, illuminated by hundreds of candles in the brilliant-cut chandeliers. Lady Maxwell! the major-domo intoned, but no one even looked Hannah's way as she stepped into the crowded ballroom. Maybe one person. Sophie Westhall pushed through the crowd. She grabbed Hannah's arm, her fingers digging painfully into the flesh as she dragged Hannah into a shadowy nook. You have no right to be here! From Sophie's high colour and the spittle forming around her lips, Hannah concluded the Honourable Sophie Westhall was not pleased. Hannah shook her arm free and produced the invitation card. I have every right to be here, she said calmly. Now, if you'll excuse me, Sophie, I am sure your friends will be wondering where you have gone. The encounter had unnerved her, and Hannah selected an uncomfortable gilded chair, which offered a good vantage of the room. She spread out the grey silk of her skirts and laid her gloved hands in her lap. If Fabian was to be among the invited guests tonight, she would see him long before he noticed her. But it was not Fabian who found her. Lord Easterbrook loomed up in front of her, a glass of champagne in his hand. Lady Maxwell, you are quite alone. May I offer you a drink? She smiled and thanked him as he handed her the glass. Unbidden, he hitched his coattails and took a seat beside her. There is no need to keep me company, your lordship, Hannah said. He coughed. Lady Maxwell, I wish to apologise on behalf of Miss Westhall. Hannah shrugged. What for? She is not your responsibility. Yet, he said, and his mouth took on a downward cast. I was privy to her recounting of her treatment of you, and, to be honest, I was appalled to read and destroy someone's private correspondence, and then to dismiss you out of hand. If he had had a chin, it would have been quivering with outrage. Hannah laid her hand over his. Thank you. You are very kind, and Sophie is entirely undeserving of you. He looked at the dance floor where Sophie was dancing with her friend Louise's brother and hefted a sigh. I will have to offer for her in the new year. My parents are expecting an engagement by the end of this season. She will lead you a merry dance. I know. He looked so miserable she almost patted his knee in sympathy. I have no advice to offer on the subject of unhappy marriages, she said, and her breath caught. Fabian had just arrived, with his sister, the Countess of Lidbury, on his arm. Lady Darlington descended on him, and after a brief exchange, he offered her his arm for the next dance. The whole room seemed to hold its collective breath as they danced. They made a perfect couple. Lord Easterbrook looked from the couple on the floor to Hannah. He harumphed and rose to his feet. The next dance is the supper dance, he said. Sophie will be expecting. Please excuse me. She waved her fan at him. Of course. Thank you for your kindness, my lord, and believe me when I say I wish you happy. He bowed and she watched him push through the crowd to rejoin Sophie and her friends. Sophie cast Hannah a hateful glance, but Lord Easterbrook took her arm and led her out onto the floor. 
Watching Fabian and Elizabeth Darlington together, Hannah's confidence began to ebb. This had been a terrible mistake. She did not belong in his world. What right did she have to think he still entertained feelings for her after all these years? Maybe the letter Sophie had destroyed had spoken of love in a past tense. What if he had been telling her that it was all over and she should stay away? Her breath constricted in her throat and she rose from her shadowed seat. Wrapping her shawl around her shoulders, she slipped out onto the terrace. The snow-covered garden stretched down to the Thames and the bright lights from the house sparkled in the pristine whiteness and the dark depths of the river. She turned her face to the stars, fighting the wave of loneliness and desolation that swept over her. A choking sob escaped, drawn away on the cold river breeze. It is too cold to be out here. She started at the once familiar voice, the breath stopping in her throat. She could not move, didn't dare look around, in case the man that stood behind her was nothing more than her imagination. I like the cold. It reminds me I am alive, she said, wondering how one correctly addressed French aristocracy, and adding, My lord. My lord. His voice held a murmur of amusement. What happened to Fabian? Fabian was a boy I knew a long time ago, she said. I do not believe I would recognize him any more. I would be surprised if he recognized me. The snow on the terrace crunched beneath his feet as he moved towards her. He stood so close she could almost feel his warm breath on her neck. If he touched her, she would melt. But he has never forgotten you, Hannah Linton. As soon as I had parole, I wrote to you, but your mother replied saying that you had married that man Maxwell and I was not to write again. A choked sob rose in Hannah's throat and she leaned her gloved hands on the wall of the terrace. The snow soaked through them, but she hardly felt the pain of the cold dampness. I destroyed that letter. If my husband had found it, she swallowed back the tears. It was too cruel, Fabian, so I told her to write to you. He laid a hand on her shoulder and she shrank from his warmth. Too cruel. Did you think I married Maxwell willingly? I was the price of his silence. He would have seen Mamma and I both hang for harbouring an enemy. But why? What did you have that he wanted so badly? She laughed, a short, bitter laugh. My body, Fabian. He wanted sons, but I, I failed him. There had been pregnancies and miscarriages, and then, mercifully, Maxwell's death. His hand tightened, forcing her to turn to face him. He stood with his back to the brightly lit ballroom, his face shadowed and immobile, like the carved face of a statue. A face she had known so well, harder now than it had been all those years ago, but still the face of Fabian Brassard, her first and only love. I abandoned you to a terrible fate with that monster. You paid a heavy price for my freedom. Can you find it in your heart to forgive me? Forgive you? Forgive you? I have never stopped loving you, dreaming that, despite everything, you would return and rescue me, but you never came. There is nothing to forgive, she said at last. Maxwell died in a hunting accident. It was the happiest day of my life. He lifted her right hand and grimaced. Your glove is wet. Allow me. He peeled off the long grey glove and drew an audible breath as the little garnet ring sparkled in the light flooding from the ballroom like a ruby. He raised her hand to his lips and kissed the ring. The first day of Christmas my true love sent to me. The familiar words of the Christmas carol drifted out through the open door. Carolers, Hannah said. I haven't truly celebrated Christmas since the day they took you away. How could I celebrate a season of happiness and love without you in my life? He placed a finger under her chin and raised her face to the light, a gentle smile curving the corners of his lips. Nine years is a long time to wait. Is it too late for Fabian and Hannah? he murmured as he kissed each finger in turn and turning her hand over, 
brushed his lips across her palm. He drew her into him and she snuggled into his warmth, suddenly conscious of the cold and her inadequate gown. Their lips met and they entwined as the long years slipped away and they could be once more just Fabian and Hannah. When they broke apart, the carolers were singing. The fifth day of Christmas my true love gave to me five golden rings. He smiled. Happy Christmas, Hannah Linton. As he bent to kiss her again, she whispered, Happy Christmas, Fabian Brassard. About the author Alison Stewart writes historical romances and short stories set in England and Australia and across different periods of history. She is best known for The Postmistress and The Gold Miner's Sister, stories set in the Victorian goldfields in the 1870s. She also writes historical mysteries as A. M. Stewart, and her popular Harriet Gordon mystery series is set in Singapore in 1910. She lives in Melbourne, Australia, with her husband and a geriatric cat. In a past life, Alison worked as a lawyer across a variety of disciplines, including the military and emergency services. She has lived in Africa and Singapore, and, when circumstances permit, travels extensively, all for research, of course. Thank you for listening to A Christmas Love Redeemed by Alison Stewart, a Regency romance novella, narrated by Catherine Bilson. Originally published, Escape Publishing, 2021. Audio edition, A Portet Publishing, 2024. For more books by this author, visit her website at alisonstewart.com.